The next video on our How to Pass the Pediatric Advanced Life Support Like a Boss series is Shock and Pals. So let's look at the four different types of shock and pals. Hypovolemic shock, where we're having a loss of fluids, can be caused by gastroenteritis, burns, hemorrhage, inadequate fluid intake, increased body fluid losses, osmotic diaphoresis, vomiting, and diarrhea. A low blood volume may be noted, often due to hemorrhage or fluid shifting out of the vasculature. Cardiogenic shock, we get a problem with our heart, it's not pumping adequately, and causes can be congenital heart diseases, myocarditis, cardiomyopathy, or an arrhythmia. Distributive shock is caused by sepsis, anaphylaxis, or spinal cord injuries. Usually blood vessel dilation, such as um, septic shock, is also noted with these distributive shocks. And obstructive shock. Causes can be tension pneumothorax, cardiotamponade, pulmonary embolism, constriction of the ductus arteriosus, ductal dependent congenital heart lesions. It's actually a physical block of some sort of blood flow is noted with obstructive shock. So compensated shock, hypotensive shock, and cardiac arrest. During compensated shock, the body begins to experience a state of low blood volume, but is still able to maintain blood pressure and organ perfusion by increasing the heart rate and constricting the blood vessels. During hypotensive shock, the body begins to experience impaired perfusion, vasodilation, and reduced SVR that rapidly progresses to cardiac arrest if it is not corrected. Hypotension during this stage is considered a late finding in most types of shock. So let's look at something that is routinely discussed within the healthcare industry, and that is sepsis and pediatrics. So signs and symptoms of sepsis include low systolic blood pressure, tachycardia or bradycardia if the child is less than one years old, elevated white blood cell counts, tachypenia, high or low temperatures above 101.3 or below 96.8. In these patients, we want to evaluate the patient for signs and symptoms of sepsis. Identification occurs through our vital signs and our lab results, and we need to intervene by identifying the cause and how to fix it. If the problem identified as sepsis, you want to first start with antibiotics and then move on from there. So let's look at the management of pediatric shock. There's a couple things that we want to do. We want to begin by oxygenating our patient and monitoring their pulse oximetry. We're reviewing electrocardiograms for any changes. IV and IO access is implemented. Blood glucose monitoring and basic life support is indicated in these patients. So let's look at the management of hypovolemic shock through either non-hemorrhagic or hemorrhagic causes. Non-hemorrhagic causes, we're going to give 2 mLs per kilogram of normal saline or lactated ringers. We're going to repeat this as needed. It is important to note, if the patient's blood pressure does not respond after 3 boluses, we move on to vasopressors. We may also want to consider colloids potentially for these patients. Hemorrhagic shock. We want to control the external bleeding if there is any external bleeding noted. 20 mLs per kilogram of normal saline or lactate and ringer bolus are usually repeated every two to three times as needed, but the main thing we want to do is transfuse packed red blood cells if the cause is hemorrhagic. So with cardiogenic shock management, whether it be bradyarrhythmia or tachyarrhythmia, we want to use the bradycardia algorithms or the tachycardia with poor perfusion algorithms. I have recorded this in a separate video, so I'll include a link up here in the corner to those videos. Other potential causes, such as myocarditis, cardiomyopathy, and poisoning, we're gonna give a little bit less of fluid, either five to 10 mLs per kilogram of normal saline or lactated ringer boluses, and we're gonna repeat as needed because we have a problem with the pump of our heart. We also might want to look at vasoactive infusions and consider expert consultation for these patients. Distributive shock. So with sepsis, we want to use the septic shock algorithm. Anaphylaxis, we're going to give IM epinephrine or auto-injector, fluid boluses of 20 mLs per kilogram of normal saline or lactated ringers, albuterol, antihistamines or corticosteroids, or an epinephrine infusion. Neurogenic, we're going to do the same, 20 mLs per kilogram of normal saline or lactated ringer bolus as needed, and we may even want to consider vasopressors if it's indicated. 
Lastly, we have obstructive shock management. So with ductal dependent or left ventricular outflow obstruction, we can use prostaglandin E1, and that is used to keep the ductus arteriosus patent. And obviously, we want to seek expert consultation with these patients. Tension pneumothorax will be one of two things, a needle decompression or a tube thoracotomy. Cardiac tamponade, we're looking at a pericardiocentesis, and we also want to start giving them some fluids, so 20 mLs per kilogram of normal saline or lactated ringer boluses. And lastly, pulmonary embolism. Same thing with our fluid, 20 mLs per kilogram of normal saline or lactated ringer bolus, and we want to repeat that as necessary. We may also consider thrombolytics or anticoagulants, and in that case, we definitely want to seek expert consultation on treating these patients. So the last thing we're going to do is just touch again on fluid resuscitation in pediatrics. So general fluid resuscitation, as we've said, is 20 mLs per kilogram of normal saline or lactated ringers given over 5 to 10 minutes. If the issue is cardiac related, then we're going to give a little bit less fluid since the pump isn't working appropriately. So 5 to 10 mLs per kilogram of normal saline or lactated ringers, and this is given over 10 to 20 minutes to allow, the time, allow it to move a little bit better within the body. Lastly, hemorrhagic shock. We want to transfuse packed red blood cells. If the cause is loss of blood, then we want to treat what the cause is. We're not going to give normal saline or lactated ringers over a longer period of time. We want to start getting and replacing what the patient is losing, and that is packed red blood cells. I hope this video is helpful in you passing your pediatric advanced life support like a boss. If you're ready to move on to the next video of this series, go ahead and click that link up in the corner.